Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Who realized what's really wrong with our schools? Who's got it? Jason, what's wrong? <laughs> Uh, the fast ones may have to slow down and slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Excellent. Excellent. The fast ones have to slow down and the slow ones can't catch up, right? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is give you the talk I give around the country to oh, I just gave one a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll realize that some things might not apply directly to you, but I want to help you. My goal is that you'll be able to be a very effective advocate for changing the bad current system, okay? In very simple, concrete, practical ways. Okay? And we're going to do a drill in the middle, and if you get this drill down, you can change the world. Now that's a pretty big burden for me, right? <laughs> Think I can do it? Yes. I do too. So this is called the big shift. You heard them talk about proficiency. You heard them talk about competency, right? It's what we talk about here, don't we? Guess what? We've been doing it for 40 years. It's just now catching on. This is a smart code where people can get a bunch of references. This is what I used to call my talk. And I went to Boston to give my talk. I guess I should turn on my microphone now. Does that help a little bit? Does that help a little bit? Was it already on? There we go. Okay. So I was going to give this talk in Boston because my friend said, the name of your book, Mark, has to be Crossing the Finish Line. How many of you run the marathon? Raise your hands really high if you run the marathon. Great. Raise your hand if you know somebody who runs the marathon. Aren't you just glad they ran the marathon? Aren't they way up there? Well, the idea of our school and these kind of schools is everyone can cross the finish line, right? Doesn't matter when, it's crossing it that's important. And I took that out of my speech because they had a, the, the bombing at the Boston Marathon, right? And they said, don't you dare. We're Boston strong. And no bunch of, no bunch of idiots are going to change what's important to us. Keep it in there and, and tell our story, OK? And by the way, the only reason I'm here today is Alejandro. Alejandro kept saying, Mark, you keep giving these talks. Why don't you give us the talk? So if it goes badly, who are we going to blame? <laughs> Just want to point that out. So this is a big shift from, from what's really a bad system called the factory model of education, switching to the model that you know. But you're going to hear about it in a lot of different forms. Who's ever heard of the automobile? They don't all look the same, right? But there are same, some things that are fundamental. Within this movement, different people are getting their students across the finish line in different ways. OK? They don't all have study technology. They don't all have the same tools that we have. But I wanted you to know that there's lots of ways that the world is changing. Now, I'm only going to cover these nine things. So at the end, we'll see how I did. Fair enough? Now, if we don't fix our schools, do you think that's sort of serious? Well, we do. Uh, one report that goes out to private schools, if the schools don't move away from the 20th century factory paradigm of education, a paradigm is a model, a way of thinking, right? It'll destroy private schools. So we think that if we don't switch from factory model schools, we're all going to die. Now, you might not worry about that, but imagine someone in the operating room, right, who's working on you, who got a bad grade in your surgery or in your disease. Or how about the pharmacist who's giving you some medication whose math facts are out? Right? Or someone who's repairing your airplane that you're about to get on. I don't know if you know about this, but some years ago, a man reassembled an engine and had extra parts, and they left them out. When they later found out why a plane dropped three miles, it was in a book on illiteracy because he didn't know how to read the manual and didn't know what to do with the extra parts. Pretty scary. So we try to get schools to change. But sometimes it's difficult, right? Now, adults laugh at this slide. It's the only funny slide I have, so just laugh now, OK? OK, good. Now, I'm going to take you to Chugach, Alaska, where in 1995, I read this article about the school system that was doing so badly that nobody graduated from high school, no one went to college, and they rarely read a book. 
They called this crisis so serious it was like being on a burning oil platform. They had to jump. They had to go to something different. So they convinced the State Board of Education, no more grades, no more credit for being in class. You know what that is, that seat time? If you go to class every day, you get a grade and then you move on. Probably the stupidest invention, right? So, uh, you know, I could go into depth about this, but you'd be surprised from this article, George Lucas, I guess you might have heard of George, right? The Star Wars dude, right? Well, he's so concerned about education, he founded this magazine and this whole group called Edutopia. And this school district is the poorest district in, in Alaska, 22,000 square miles. It's huge, it's barren, and they're lost. But look what they've done. They've now come up with a way of studying where they say, I'm at level five in math, level seven in reading, level six in career development. Get the idea? They're not all going at the same pace. This is revolutionary. Why they made it in the papers? Because they won this huge award, the Malcolm Baldridge Award of Excellence. First time, it's just, it's just amazing to them. And this is a big news to them, right? To move to the next level, you must master the one that precedes it. Now this is new and groundbreaking, you understand? Wow. Every child must learn every subject at every level, passing with proficiency at what they call 80%. Isn't that exciting? I mean, this is really exciting. It was so exciting that you might know Catherine Imrani. She went to Alaska, went to the school district, and bought this book because other schools wanted to follow that model. And then Rich DiLorenzo, the superintendent, wrote this book called Delivering on the Promise. This is getting pretty exciting, right? And they, he explained how they got their community to buy into this, because it's very difficult to convince people, right? You've maybe had that trouble when you train the people about Delphian, right? They say, what? There's no lectures at the front of the room? You don't take tests every week on a Friday and learn something new on Monday and skip and doesn't matter what you didn't learn? So he wrote this book and moved to Colorado and he formed this group called the Reinventing Schools Coalition. So this is pretty exciting. And now there's lots of schools that are, have joined his coalition. And that's just one way that proficiency is being done. I thought I'd show you the slide that they use. This is the slide and I think you can understand it. It's, it's from the big poster on the side, but it says, Right? Here's the problem. We've got to shift from so all students can learn. How many people understand learning is 24-7? That's our motto, right? You just don't learn now and then stop. But a public school model is you go to school, you learn, then you go crazy, then you come back, right? But it really is 24-7. So here's the problem, right? And when students own their own learning, this is like revolutionary, students owning their own learning, right? Teachers guide and grow. And look at these great results. They've gotten fantastic improvements in how the students are doing. So that's pretty neat. And this is, the reason I'm showing it is because this is from their slides. So the old school model, time was the constant, right? Learning was the variable. That's stupid and wrong, who agrees? Learning should never be the variable. That's like saying, you'll all go to the hospital for three days. You just need a splinter taken out and you need a heart transplant, you're out of there in three days. But that's how the system talks, doesn't it? And, and the question is, why have we been so stupid for so long? That's when you're gonna have to answer because this is your world, right? This is a really badly designed system called the factory model. And here's how it works, okay? See that? Learning is the constant, time is the variable. Personal mastery honors students' unique differences. Individual needs are met. Students are given opportunity to move at their own pace. This is like exciting new news. And you're going, duh, right? Who's going, duh? Well, you should keep saying duh because not all schools have come over to this and very few private schools even understand this. It's really crazy. So students are no longer prisoners of time. Now many of you know I'm a recovering attorney, right? But I think that's very strong language to call students prisoners. Who would agree? That's sort of cruel and nasty. Good thing I didn't say it. A whole report was issued called the Prisoners of Time because our whole system was based on time. 
like in a factory. Paint dries in four hours, you move the next one along, right? Bread bakes in 50 minutes. They, could, they invented our schools like factories. And they were time-based. That's the cover of the report. You see the, the time, the sand, right? This report was issued by famous, very well-known American educators and leaders. And the report said the length of the school day and the school year remain the same. Everything else has changed. How many of you know what a phone is like that you have stuck to the wall, right? We don't do that anymore, right? And you used to have to stay at home and watch TV live because if you weren't home, you missed it. Everything else has changed. But the rule is learn what you can in the time we make available. But we know that people learn at different rates and in different ways with the different subjects. Now, maybe you don't believe that. Raise your hand if you think that's true, that people learn in different ways at different times. Well, this is a big deal. So what are they doing at Wilsonville, Oregon? They study four days a week, and then on Friday they go to study hall to catch up on what they missed. Now that's a revolutionary approach, right? Isn't that exciting, though? So the students don't take the test on Friday, come back on Monday with a new subject. They end off on Thursday, they come back on Friday. And this is right off of their website, and that's here in Oregon. At the end of term, they wait, you have two weeks to catch up and fix up all that you didn't get before you go on. Is this not exciting? I, I get really worked up about this because the time available in the uniform six-hour day and 180-day school year is the flaw in our design system, right? You understand that? You all get this. As I said, some of this might be boring to you, but this is new news to my audiences. They pay me a lot of money. They fly me in. They put me in the front of the room with a bunch of people, right? And afterward, their jaws drop, and they come to my workshop. I'm just telling you, this is a big deal. Because we built the learning enterprise on a foundation of sand. And this is what I tell my audiences. I don't know about you, but at my students, my, at my school, my students have hormones, hunger, hurt feelings, music. They worry about the game or the dance. They don't all arrive at the same time, ready to learn in the same way on the same schedule. Who would agree? And we have to address those factors, right? We certainly don't expect that you all came here this morning just thinking about Mark, right? How many of you came here thinking about Mark? Oh, this is a touchy thing. But you get the point. We can't assume that every day, every student is ready for some blah, 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 right? Who's ever been in the blah, 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 blah system? It's deadly, right? It's nasty, it's evil, it's wrong, it's bad. And that's me talking subtly. So there's new proficiency approaches that I'm telling you about. Now, I had to put this map up because the next slide people didn't understand. Those are New England states, and that's what that single is. So in New England, they're spending five years to implement proficiency graduation requirements. I'm just trying to show you around the country where this is happening. Now, what the next thing we have to get rid of is letter grades. Who knows about letter grades? The second stupidest thing ever invented. Absolutely meaningless. Now, the good thing is, it's not just my opinion. I've got lots of books that point it out. And this is why I'm talking to you sort of more maturely. Why did we keep something so stupid for so long, right? Anybody know adults who are still scared of ATM machines? When they first came out, kids got it right away, right? And adults didn't get it. Adults sometimes are slow to change. But this grade thing makes no sense. Letter grades, right? Here's a whole book talking about what's the matter with the grades. And what does he say down here? Grading is not essential for teaching and learning, right? It's certainly complicated, and it's certainly very subjective, right? In one of those systems, everybody, got, everybody gets a grade they didn't deserve, good or bad. Who knows what I'm talking about? And you, and you don't get a credit for learning, you get a credit for doing whatever the teacher wants, right? Which might include just being friendly with them. And if they like you, they'll give you a good grade. So with, this is a grading dilemma. Grading is not important. I went to the special webinar all about grading, and this world expert said we don't need grades for anything. You can teach without grades. You can go to Lowe's and learn how to paint your house or plaster or install a new toilet, right? without a grade. 
You can go learn to fly without a grade. You can learn to drive without a grade, go to the DMV, take a driving test, take a written test and drive, right? They don't even care you went to driving school. But we're really stupid on this subject. And this is a stupid tweet about assessment. These grades in, in the public school system have numbers by them that don't mean anything, right? They have no meaning. You can't even begin to convince me that a number means anything about learning, right? And then we attach letters to them as though they make sense. And then I went to a high school, look at this. An A is four points, five points, or six points, right? Any grade above a 69 is passing. What? Right? It, the whole system is flawed, and educators get this. Uh, it, I, I was part of an Oregon Education Roundtable of, of educators, and they, they came up to the fact that, that, you know, we have to use proficiency, what you know and can do, instead of letter grades. Now, who knows what's really wrong with grades? Because I haven't told you yet. What's really wrong with grades? Anybody want to? Yes, sir. Yeah. Was passing. So you could have a 69 surgeon and then 100 surgeon. You got it. Totally different by the putting in a thing. Yeah. That's right, but it's not as right as I'm going to be in a minute. <laughs> Miles. Because people are graded on the bell curve. That's right. The system is designed for not all students to get a good education. That's its model, right? Can you imagine a factory that not all of its DVD players are going to work? Can you imagine in which only 69 of 100, right, work, right? Well, if we make 69 that work, it's passing. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's so crazy that we find out that when we talk to college admissions people, they have no idea what the grades mean. Sometimes they just ignore them. This is just, make, this is just insane. Because this is what they figure. If you go to school, a couple will get an A, more will get B, most will get a C. Who wants to take C medicine? Who wants to have some C milk? Right? Some seafood pervert served in the dining room, you know? Not good fish, but it's just crazy. And then they, then they, they show the grades that they give out. It just gets worse and worse, OK? Now, how many of you know little kids? Maybe even were a little kid once. Little kids, by the time they're two years old, learn a language, learn to control their bodies, and to manipulate adults, to get them to do anything they want, all without formal classes or a grade. That's my argument. But the system is designed so that, not ever, that they assume not everybody's going to get it. The bell curve says some of you have to flunk, right? Some of you get half of it. Why would you design a system like that? Who gets it? Well, I'm not quite done. If you want to transfer to this college, you can transfer with all your two years of college classes with a D minus, and you're welcome to come to this school. Miles, is this the second stupidest thing you've heard? Yeah. It is really stupid. So they've moved to a lot of standard-based grading, which we're, you're familiar with. You restudy what you don't know. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Lindsay High School. They have 13 learning targets in a class. You finish one, you move to two. They said, what about if you're a senior and you only get 12 of 13 French learning targets? You come back in the summer. You master learning target 13, then we give you your diploma. I said, what else would you do? So I just got off the phone yesterday with a company called Jump Rope, which actually publishes, they're one of many that publish standard-based grade books. They don't have grades, but they have the mastery. They track your progress, right? Similar to maybe your student program. At, there in, in uh, Wilsonville, you get, a, you get points, right? And then you, you move up from, from nothing to proficient to highly proficient. But guess what? Everybody can get one of these. I gave the same talk. You know where the theater is in McMinnville? And then there's that college next to it called Chemeketa? Well, I spoke to all their faculty a year ago, did their staff training, and I gave the same talk. And at this point, the head of the school said, I'm with Mark. If you can set learning targets for your students and they all meet them, they can all get A's. He was so moved by my talk. 
Okay? So you can move people to change on this. There's another proficiency scale all over the place, right? This is a famous Oregon educator. He said, there are many things broken about traditional grading systems, especially they misrepresent, misrepresent student learning and ne negatively affect students' motivation to learn. Who knows what that means? Why the heck are you going to study if Kayla and Rosemary and Michelle are going to get the A's already because they're so smart, right? So I'm dozing in this class. Why work hard, right? and get no reward, because I'm going to get a C no matter what just by showing up. Who knows what I'm talking about? That is sick. That is disaster. That is planes that crash and cars that fall apart. You get the point? You're with me, I think. Okay. So there's lots of proficiency-based grading, and that just means you get one target, you master it, you move to the next, right? And students carry around notebooks showing all the subjects they're moving on these targets. And everybody's helping everybody. It's a really neat thing. So crossing the finish line, right? So here's my conviction. Grades are bad because they make winners and losers. And the only thing that should lose in education is ignorance. You should not be competing with, your, with each other. That's the wrong model. Teams, yes. Education, no. Do you want your two medical students competing? Or do you want them all to get it all so they can do well? I could go all into that subject, but proficiencies are good because everyone wins. Everyone crosses the finish line. That's what it's like here, isn't it? I tell people when we play class games, I don't care if you're on the lowest spelling level to the highest. If you get your level done this week, we win, right? But you see how revolutionary that is? See why they've had to come talk to you today? So no more age-based grade levels. This is probably the third stupidest thing. Your date of manufacture determines what class you're going to be in. Thank you for laughing. You know, when you were born. But we all know that maybe you're a better reader and slower in math, right? Why do we put you in one room with a bunch of people born the same day you were? Is that stupid or what? Totally stupid. So I'm against that too. And so here's that article where a guy wants to decouple age and grade level. He's a superintendent there in Phoenixville. I'm trying to show you that I'm not the only one. So this radical idea, you only proceed when you show proficiencies. By now, educators are sort of wondering if this will even work, right? But you all know it works, true? But do you realize what a different world you're in? How many of you go home and try to, and try to understand what the other people are doing, right? Right? It's like another world, isn't it? And, and they try to make sense of it all. So now here's the drill. Are you ready? Somebody's going to ask me about the Delphian School. Tell me about the Delphian School. Somebody's going to ask me. Yes? Could you tell me about the Delphian School? Sure. Well, if you're as old as I am, you probably went to an old school, factory model, where we went to class for 50 minutes for 180 days, and maybe learning happened, maybe it didn't. But time was a constant. We're a new school, where learning is the constant and time is the variable. You got it? I can have never finished that sentence. You know why? They start talking about the class in which they fell behind. So what I want you to do is just drill that one line, OK? Explain to them, right? You heard what I said. The old school is the factory model where time was the constant, right? Learning varied if it occurred at all. Our school, learning is the constant, and time is the variable. First of all, do you like that? Isn't it an easy way to explain what we do? So go to it. OK, so you got it, right? Now, I think that if you tell enough people like that, the world will change for the better. Who agrees? Because it's not theory anymore, right? And that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you lots of examples where this is happening everywhere. So you don't have to say, oh, you have to come to Oregon on the school on this hill, right? Of course, we're the best at it. We've been at it for more than 40 years. Mr. Harper developed a system, right, that's revolutionary. And they're slowly catching on. Oregon is catching on. Um, that book that, you, that I'll show you right here has become popular all around the country. It came out of Oregon, Oregon teachers. I've worked on it with the author. She's been out here to the school. We work all the time. There's a group in Oregon called the Business Education Compact that have been doing proficiency here since 2002. 
and, and I work with them a lot. They give classes. They uphold school districts in Oregon. And all around Oregon, this is happening, okay? This is a book that I, I want everybody to buy, the hardback, not the Kindle. It's called Inevitable, Mass Customized Learning. And if I had time, I'd show you videos by the authors because uh, they're really neat. Because they say, uh, it's just inevitable. Just like the computer that I have here, Bill Purple had ordered for me. It's got extra batteries. It's got, instead of a disk drive, it's got batteries in there. It's for me so that I can run it unplugged and make presentations anywhere, right? That's why I got it. But it came off an assembly line, right? You can order things on assembly line so the new factory isn't making all of one thing, right? And they take the time to do it right. They care about that I have all the parts, not how long it took. So this is a great book. This is the teacher's edition. Just this, I just found this one. They've been so popular, they've published a second book for teachers. And I end up, people steal all my copies. <laughs> Every time I speak, I'm not bringing one here, I'll lose another copy. But it's such a good book. And it's by teachers who have done this all over the country, switched over. And the point is, just remember the title, it's inevitable. We're going to switch to this new method, okay? And this is the story I want to tell you in depth. This is a really bad way to do a PowerPoint to show you an entire article. Who's ever heard of the Wall Street Journal? Pretty recognized, right? Not too radical, would you say? Pretty reliable. Well, this is some schools scrap age-based grade levels focusing on mastery of material. This is the headline, right? Now, this is a long story that came out last year. And I'm going to walk you through it for some key points. This is the teacher. These, all students in one room are taught at different levels at their own pace. Now, this is breaking news. You get it? Is this not exciting? I'm like very excited about this. And the problem is, like, instead of content level seven, these students age 11 to 14 are writing essays. Some are computers. They're all working at their own pace and earning credits in advance after they master the material, not because they've spent time in the class. This is the Wall Street Journal. Now, we didn't tell you where this school is. Uh, it, it does point out that we're, we're doing this all around the country, working on this digital or competency, all those words, right? I, even there's the um, Barack Obama Charter School that's proficiency-based. It's in California. But here's what I want to tell you. This line is very telling. 95% of the pupils are Latino, 100% qualify for free lunch. You know what that tells you? This is the poorest area in California. It's halfway uh, between Northern and Southern California, out in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, well, I'll tell you the punchline in a minute. Okay? Their scores are moving up in all subjects. Right? Objective tests. Everybody's excited. And um, it wasn't a tweak of the old system. They dismantled the old system and built a new one. Okay? Now teachers must track every student during biweekly sessions. They move them in and out of different classes at a moment's notice, right? So they're in the right class at the right, uh, learning the right thing. Students must pass exams to prove they met learning targets. They're not moved ahead. They have to master the material, OK? Now that's sort of boring and abstract. Well, uh, two weeks ago, I went to Portland to meet with the principal from Lindsay High School, had lunch with him, because he gave a great presentation, OK? This is from their from their school district site. And that's the video that I started just a minute ago, OK? And I want to show you this video. And this is on their website that you can get. La -dee -da -dee -da. <coughs> Try one more time. Okay, now we're back. For years, we've sat kids in rows and told them to listen to the teacher up front. But that's not the way life happens. I remember that we would all, everybody would sit down, the students would sit down, and we would all be on page 10. I 
had to wait for the whole class to pass something. You, everyone had to run at the same pace. If you did not run at the same pace, you were left behind. You were kind of like, okay, you got to catch up. It was hard. I was left behind in elementary school. I was the one that was pushed forward and wasn't ready to be. And so I know what that feels like. I always felt like I was a little bit of a slower learner than everyone else, at, at least ac academically. And I always felt like I was left behind. When you, when you fell behind, you, you really fell behind and everybody just went on without you. I'm kind of baffled that I, that I, that I passed uh, junior high. I did not feel confident enough to even share anything because I felt dumb. It was easy to just um, not really prove that you really knew it. So my goal was really to just get out of there. At Performance Based is really where students complete real world tasks rather than simply pencil and paper uh, type of assignments that may not be as relevant. So I, I believe that the performance based uh, system really deals with more real world learning than we have done in our schools for a long time. We aren't saying to our learners, give us the answer to problem 10. We're saying, here's a real world problem and, and there might not be a textbook right answer, but if you're able to think critically and be creative, you'll be able to arrive at a solution. I mean, you have to think outside the box, and you have to be able to put real life things into your project or whatever it is that you're doing. In construction, you learn how to nail the first semester, okay? But can you nail second semester making a truss? Can you nail uh, a drywall? Can you nail... So as you see, it's something that the performance-based system tests on is continuous performance. Because they're learning how to learn, I have so much more trust that they are going to do well when they leave us. Whereas in a traditional system, I did not believe that. We have students walking around talking about how they're going to be accepted to major colleges. I want to go to college. I'd like to get a master's. And then transfer to a law school. I will go to the school of pretty much my dreams. It's possible to get anything except like immortality or something, but you know, you can get almost anything you want. To see kids that in a traditional system would fall through the cracks, to see that we're catching more of those kids, and to see that they're graduating, and to see that they've got plans for the future, it's, it's been a really, really powerful experience. We're teaching them to be leaders, and we're doing that by transforming education and how we support leadership in the classroom. What this model does is it transforms everybody's thinking in terms of the learners now become leaders in their classrooms. Everybody in this system is a leader. It's no longer, how is Ms. Lopez teaching? It's, how are my students learning? The students in my classroom, they have become teachers. They're teaching each other. They're teaching me every day. And so they have, um, they, they are empowered right now. I do consider myself as a leader in the classroom. It seems really real when I know something like maybe in like math and I know how to do, you know, this equation or maybe in English I know how to write this type of essay. It, it feels cool to be able to go out and teach it. It motivated me to do more and to help others. It's like a showing a man a fish, you show a village a fish and one helps the other one and it continues and it's really nice to watch. Truly we've had to rethink the entire uh, system around that. It's a culture of shared decision making. We're all stakeholders in this process. The teachers all know about it, the students know about it, they're using the same vocabulary. It isn't a top-down kind of thing so much as it is uh, everyone understanding what the vision is. It means um, taking a look at everything we do, every process, every action and if the learner isn't at the center of that then we need to rethink uh, what we're doing there. I've traveled all over the country to do work with school systems and when I look at what's happening here and what the vision is here uh, it's my hope. When you see it done at a system-wide level you really don't want to work in any other kind of school. So I've said for many years that I would never be a part of an educational system that is not performance based um, and that hasn't changed and I don't plan on changing that anytime soon. I don't see me going back to that. I, I honestly don't think I could teach in that traditional setting. I'm not going back. I could never go back to a traditional system. In 
fact, as a country, we can't go back to traditional ways of thinking and learning. We've got to move forward, and performance-based learning is the way to do that. The traditional system is out the window. It's gone, and this is the future for these kids and Lindsay, and um, I'm just happy to be part of it. I'd like you to hear your thoughts before I go on. Who wants to share their thoughts? Ashton. Well, I think that this is a really great idea and the right idea, but I don't see how that really, how we can really change our education system in America to get this idea quickly or rapidly. Okay. I can wait. Yes, Nikita. I thought Delphi was one of the only schools that were doing proficiency-based learning. But now from this team and this seminar, I like, know that it's more prevalent in the world and that there's actually hope. Uh huh. So you and Ashton aren't getting along. <laughs> well, no, I understand what he's saying. But we don't like Ashton. Because <laughs> this is what I dedicate my life to, obviously, right? Anyone else? I'm not going to go on until at least some, one more person says something. Yes, hey. Well, I think that I, after this, I kind of realized a little how lucky we are here and how since we have been to the system, we can go out and get a lot of money from the background. Absolutely. And that's why I try to give you a simple tool. Because yeah. you can say that drill now, right? Yeah. Everybody gets that, by the way. You understand? I've been doing it hundreds of times. So remember my friend at Shugach, Rick DiLorenzo wrote the book, Delivering on the Promise? He moved to Colorado, Adams School District 50. And so here's an article that says, four years later, it's actually working. OK? So Ashton, we got Alaska. Now we got Colorado. And then I met this guy. I'll show you his slides, right? And look at this. Students have begun to see themselves at the center of their education. Now I just want to scream. I just want to yell. They're beginning to see themselves at the center of their education. Where were they before? Do you understand how crazy that is? Right? They were just ping pong balls, and people were driving them around. Right? Does that make any sense? That we had students that weren't designed around teachers? At Lindsay, they don't have students anymore. They're called learners. They don't have teachers. They have facilitators, right? They don't have school. They call it their education environment. They've changed all the words to get rid of the stupid thinking. So this is Adams School District 50. And so at this conference, here's the guy from Adams School District. I won't show you the, the video today because we don't have time. But you can go to Adams School District 50. I'll be glad to pass this site on. But this is a whole public school system, Ashton, that says, Adams District approach to learning is referred to as competency-based system. The entire educational system is organized around engaging students in 21st century schools, working at their development levels and advancing only where they have demonstrated proficiency or competency. Learning is the constant, time is the variable. Personalized delivery. Okay? So maybe I can convince Ashton, because I'm not done. This is what they say, learning matters most, right? They teach at, at their instructional level in all content areas. Guaranteed is flexible. Here's what matters least. Time matters least. You getting the idea? These are slides from their school district site. I didn't make these slides. Learning matters most. Time matters least. Personalized delivery. And we're systematic. We're going to help everybody get through it. Right? Whatever you need, because students are important. And this is a, an interesting quote. Because we know we could do better. The minute you came to Delphi and you realized the system you'd been in earlier was just crazy, right? It doesn't take rocket science to see what's wrong. So this is the video. But look at the last slide in the, in the show that they had. What's it say? Right? This is new. Right? This is new for them. How many of you think your, your own education is unique for you? What else would it be? 
We're not Nazi Germany or something, right? So teachers like it. This is the, we've had proficiency conferences here in Oregon. I just want to show you. It says Oregon Proficiency Conference. I drove all the way down to Lane County early one morning. Rosemary said, where are you going today? I don't know. You know, went down there. This was a terrible conference. You know why? I wanted to be in every session. And people said, you go there. I'll go here. You take notes, right? But it was over 200 teachers who were all just trying to do it, figure out in their classrooms and sharing, right? How can we do it better? How can we do it in science? How can we do it in social studies? Then they had a second conference, right? Where was I? With students back in Washington or New York. Then they had a third conference. And you notice the, the lady there is the speaker who wrote, she wrote the book, Inevitable, right? And Chuck Schwann in the video at Lindsay is the other author of the book. And then I went to this one, right? And this is called Leadership Grit, because Ashton, we have a crisis in leadership because now everybody knows the system's out ethics, right? Just like racism, just like not letting women to vote, right? Now we all know. You with me? This is like important. But look at the speaker, Jaime Robles, right? You just saw Jaime. He's from Lindsay High School. He was a keynote speaker. He was like me on steroids. He was so worked up. And he explained how they get into college and how they help each student and they help the families. He told us something grim. Nine years ago, he'd had it because there was a fight at every school break, lunch, and after school, every day, like scheduled. And kids were getting killed and hurt. Kids were drinking. They'd take their Gatorade, pour some Gatorade out, put in vodka, and they were on vodka buzz all day long. Right? The statistic, when they wrote the Wall Street Journal article, it said, gang have dropped almost zero. Because if you're doing well in school, why would you be stupid and do gang stuff, right? You know that? Same like, it was just incredible. Now, Ashton, you're going to feel really bad now. Have you ever heard of the state of, uh, like, Connecticut, New Hampshire, things like that? Well, this is a book. We're all of New Hampshire. This is a book by the superintendent from New Hampshire. The whole state switched. They went off the clock. They went to competency, okay? This is Maine. Who's ever heard of Maine? Maine, this is from their website. The whole state. Right? Proficiency-based diplomas. What do you think, Paul? Am I winning a little bit? Okay. Ashton's one of my best friends, but I want him to lose this argument. Right? Wouldn't you like to lose your argument, Ashton? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this, is the, this is the website from the main school district. Look what it says. Proficiency-based learning. Look at all those words that we know. You see what I mean? Now, Ashton is right. It's very difficult to convince people about this. Okay? It's been very difficult. Chugach came up with seven major steps, and you have to have each one in to get the people in the community, right? And can we go to college, and can we get jobs? But I don't have time to show you all the articles. Every day now, I get news feeds on all the breakthroughs around the country and around the world. And I don't even have time to tell you, but I can tell you this. Many colleges are switching to proficiency. Many colleges, and, and I can give a separate talk, I can give you on my website where I write all my blogs, I can tell you all about it, okay? But this is Maine has the master plan to put learners first. This is all this competency and proficiency, and they're doing really well. This is the Barack Obama Charter School in California. They went to proficiency, and look at the scores improving, right? This is just a little charter school and in a very, very poor neighborhood. There's a whole group internationally called Inacol, which, which has to do with blended online learning and all that stuff. And their conference now is all about what? Proficiency or competency. And I was on the phone yesterday with a guy from Jump Rope, that grading company, and they're going to this conference. I'm going to see if I can't go this year. There's so many conferences, I can't even go to them all now. Ashton. And people from all over the country and all over the world come to these. Okay? Maybe you should come with me. This is my blog. That's not to show you my picture, but right down here, you can click on resources and get a whole page of handout. I'm going to update it about books and videos so that you can become an advocate too, right? When you get somebody hooked, say, just go to our site. Mark's got all these, all these places you can go and find out more about it, right? So I could go on and on and show you these great videos by these other people who talk about what I'm talking about, right? 
but you get the idea, don't you? Who's this guy? His name is, well, I'll show you who he is. He's Robert Mendelhall, president of Western Governors University. 34,000 students, right? 17,000 graduates in 50 states. And guess what? They're proficiency-based. That's what it says right there. Competency-based online university. Who thinks that's exciting? So I could show you more dramatic videos and give you more of the talk, right? But I think you get the idea. Competency-based learning is everywhere. There's all of these groups that are learning and work. Getting into college with a proficiency-based transcript. Colleges want proficiency-based transcripts. I'm working with some colleges now to work on ours. People are learning about competency. This says 58 colleges want proficiency-based students, and they prefer them over traditional grade students. 58 colleges said, we'll give preference if you've been to a proficiency or competency-based school. How does that make you feel about your program? Pretty good, right? The US Department of Education even knows about it. Even in Washington, DC, you know? And they're really crazy there, but they understand all the value of it. All over the place. And this just shocked me. If we can get more proficient in math and science, it can boom our economy by $10 trillion. Who went to Betty Lou's with me? I wrote a thank you letter, and they wrote back to me, Mark, if we just could inspire one student to be an engineer, it'd have been worthwhile. They're now going super big, right? They can't find enough engineers, food engineers who build this equipment and do all that stuff, right? We can't find enough doctors for our hospitals, for old people like me. A bunch of us are getting older. So it's not, when we say we're all gonna die, we really need a good education system for all. That's why I say we're competing against ignorance, not each other, right? So I just wanna show you uh, this Reinventing Schools Coalition, all of these topics uh, where they come up. And I wanna show you one more slide. I wanna go back to the beginning, okay? And see how I did, okay? So sort of reminding you what we went over, but This is what I want, this is what I went over, and we'll see how we did, okay? You give me a grade. I said, the factory model of schooling, where time was a constant and learning was a variable, is dead. Who gets it? Raise your hands. So, you're proficient now, right? Okay. Now learning is the constant and time is the variable. That's the new school, right? Old school is a factory model, new school is a student-centered model. How'd you do on that? You get that? Okay. Then I said, students are no longer prisoners of time. You get that? Yes. Not so many hands. You know, I'm, you have to raise your hand or else, no. Okay, new proficiency approaches where provide individualized and personalized education where learning is the constant and time is the variable. No more letter grades, who gets it? In fact, if I was a lawyer, I would wanna sue people who make C-grade products, right? Why would schools admit they only produce average, right? I would hide all this, because that's admission of guilt, isn't it? We designed a system which not everybody's gonna be, do well. And we pay money for that? Then it says, no more age-based grade levels. Are you convinced of that? And you could communicate that to others? Students progress when they demonstrate proficiencies, right? And now here's the Ashton dilemma, the last one. This approach can be implemented in the classroom and school level, and programs work in a wide variety of settings, including the Delphian School. And I've tried to show you it works in schools, school districts, and at the state level, right? So I really want you to carry this message out there, okay? Because nothing's more important than education. Why is that? Any problem you give me, right, has to be solved by someone with an education. It's the foundation for solving every problem we have, right? I'm gonna end with a quote, okay? I don't know who said it, but I went to a meeting at the, at the Department of Education and on the cover of the book, the guy had it glued to the cover of his notebook. And he, it was a definition of a school. 
It's not a definition I'd heard before, but I keep it with me all the time. You ready? A school is four walls with the future inside. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you.